In this video, we're going to look at how writing began. How we as humans developed a set of signs that would represent the language we speak in a textual medium or a material form. And the first writing to develop over 5,000 years ago was Sumerian cuneiform. So that's Sumerian... as in Suma in Mesopotamia or modern-day Iraq. Cuneiform. And the word cuneiform comes from the Latin cuneus, which just equals, or just means, I should say, wedge, as in the distinctive wedge-shaped Sumerian writing. So to understand how cuneiform developed, let's have a look at the Sumerian word for head or, or sag. And we see that in the first instance, head is just represented with a picture of a head. And this is what we call a pictogram. And this is pretty intuitive, right? I mean, we use pictograms all the time, not least in emoji, which is just a whole system of pictograms. But over time, these symbols kind of evolve. And uh, in 3000 BCE, we don't quite know why, but the direction of the writing changed from down the tablet to across it. And at the same time, the signs were shifted on their side. And as they evolve further, they become more abstract and more standardised. And we start to see the distinctive wedge-shaped from a reed stylus being impressed on the clay tablets. So what we have at this point are what we call logograms. And by that, we simply mean a symbol that still represents a whole word, but no longer does it by pictorial resemblance. And again, logograms are something that, that we're familiar with. I mean, think about the sign for dollar. It doesn't look like a dollar, but we all know what it means. In some cases, symbols are combined with other symbols to create new ones. So, for instance, we have here the symbol for head with a few extra lines makes a mouth here. And then when that's combined with the symbol for bread, it means to eat. The scribes still face the problem of how to depict words that it's just hard to create a likeness of, particularly abstract nouns like life. Think about how, how you would depict that. Well, it turns out that the Sumerian word for life sounds a lot like the Sumerian word for arrow, T. So the solution is to take the symbol for arrow and to use it to represent life as well. And this is what linguists call the rebus principle the process of using a symbol purely for its sound value, regardless of its original meaning. And the really significant thing about the rebus principle is that it can actually be deployed in lots of different ways. Think about one-syllable words. The symbols for those words can then be used to represent that syllable across the language. And so around 2700 BCE, we find the very first example of a name being spelled purely phonetically on a gold bowl found at Ur. So the name that was found was Mes Ka Ka Lamb Dug. And the, Sumer the Sumerian symbols that uh, spelt out those syllables are what we call syllabograms. Symbols to represent syllables. And the immediate payoff for using syllabograms is that it actually allows you to reduce the number of symbols in the writing system. In the case of the Sumerians, it came down from around 1500 to around 600. So your writing system becomes a lot less unwieldy, a lot more efficient, and a lot easier to learn and transmit. The long term shift is that for the first time, symbols are being used to represent units of sound and, and no longer units of meaning, like words. And that's a significant step towards developing 
letters, which represent the most basic units of sound, phonemes, and, and that constitute an alphabet. And it's around a thousand years later, uh, around 1500 BCE, that we find one of the, the first alphabets here at a, a place called Ugarit on the eastern Mediterranean in modern day Syria. So if we know something about how cuneiform developed, maybe the next question we can ask is why it was created. After all, we're talking about centuries and centuries of, of innovation and technological development to create a writing system. What motivated the effort behind this innovation? So this is a question that's worth looking at really, really closely. And the answer is going to come down to the intensified need for really accurate and enduring record keeping and economic record keeping in a newly emerging kind of human society. And we can see this play out if we look at the example of the city of Uruk, uh, one of the Sumerian city-states, which is where we find some of the oldest cuneiform tablets. And the first thing to notice about Uruk is that it is indeed a city, arguably the, the first city and the biggest city of its time. So it's got a population of, of 50,000. And so we're dealing with a human community in which not everyone knows everyone else personally. And it also means that there are farmers outside the city who are creating a surplus which is feeding uh, bureaucrats and traders and artisans who live inside the city. What this means practically is that there's a king who, who owns much of the farmland or, or rents it to tenant farmers and the surplus from the farms is then transported to the city, to the, the temple precinct for storage and redistribution. So the temple officials need to keep track of all sorts of items like sheep and cattle and grain, leaving farms and entering the storage and then being dispersed. So it's that storage and redistribution which is the, the, the first way that uh, record keeping becomes so important in a way that it hasn't been before. And then consider Uruk is surrounded by desert, just like the other Sumerian city-states. So to make agriculture feasible, it's dependent on irrigation of the river Euphrates. And irrigation requires further record keeping about who's entitled to what water from the river at what point in time, how those rights are inherited over time. So this, this is another factor which adds to this really intensified need for accurate uh, record keeping. Thirdly, Uruk is part of a really extensive trade network. It extends all the way to modern Afghanistan in the east, where lapis lazuli was imported from, um, to, to Lebanon in the west, where, where cedar wood was imported from, and, and, and even further west. And so uh, this extensive trade requires all sorts of records about what's owed and what's owing. So trade records are a kind of third illustration of this enhanced need for record keeping that drives the innovation of writing. So a city like Uruk needs writing in lots of ways because it conducts economic interactions on a scale and complexity that really stretches the limits of human memory. But equally, it's a city like Uruk that can make writing possible. Because it's wealthy, based on an agricultural surplus, it can afford to feed a specialist class of scribes that develop the writing system, that learn to read and write, that transmit the knowledge and keep records. So reading and writing are activities that are only conducted by a very small class of specialist scribes. And those scribes are in turn in the employ of, of the ruling elite of society. What we've learned by looking at the example of Uruk is that writing 
is made necessary and possible by a particular form of human society. When we look at where writing develops globally, we see that it, it, it arises in, in different places at different times. But nevertheless, there's a really distinct pattern. And that is that all the societies which develop writing are food producing or agricultural societies that are sedentary and generally highly urbanized and engage in large scale trade and have a high degree of economic specialization. It is those societies that have a real need for writing and can afford to feed the small group of specialists who learn how to read and write.